Hello everybody, my name is Mihaela Sarbu. I am a professional services engineer at Infinite Wireless. Thank you very much for taking the time to join our webinar today. We are going to discuss about redundancy, load balancing and link aggregation using Infinite Wireless units. The agenda for today includes five items. First, we are going to review LACP, which is the control protocol for automatically setting up link aggregation. We'll find out the advantages of using automatic negotiation and what are the benefits of link aggregation in general. Next, we'll check the basic topology that requires link aggregation and afterwards I'll present a short comparison of the load balancing algorithm implemented by infinite units versus the one implemented by the switches. In the second item, we'll see what are the configuration steps using our units. Uh, starting with item 3, I will present a series of uh, scenarios that will show you how flexible our units are. Having advanced network capabilities and uh, high operational speeds, the infinite units can easily accommodate to a vast set of network topologies and uh, they can offer an increased network performance. In the fourth item, we'll see in more detail how can we benefit of both redundancy and for duplex. And in the last item, I'll present two more scenarios in order to enlarge our vision about the multitude of solutions that can be addressed using the infinite units. Link Aggregation Control Protocol, or LACP, provides a method to control the bundling of several physical ports together to form a single logical connection. In order to help us visualize and better understand the new concept, I've represented in the picture two network devices that have LACP capabilities. Ports 1 to N are considered to be part of a link aggregation group, having LACP enabled. The device users will exchange LACP control frames through all those links in order to detect the multiple links between them and combine them into a single logical link. We have to keep in mind that the devices need to be directly connected using links with the same speed and both devices should implement LACP in order to achieve automatic link aggregation. The most important thing is that LACP means automatic negotiation and this brings along a couple of advantages. First is that we will benefit of an efficient failover. In case of static link aggregation, if we have a link failure, on one side of the link, the peer device will continue to send traffic uh, through the affected link, leading to data loss. Moreover, using LACP automatic control, a device can confirm if the peer and configuration uh, will support the link aggregation establishment. In case of static link aggregation, a cabling or a configuration mistake can easily go undetected and it can cause unexpected network behavior. Besides the benefits of using automatic link aggregation establishment, let's review also the general benefits of link aggregation. By using link aggregation, you'll benefit of redundancy or fault tolerance. When a link goes down, traffic will be sent over the remaining active links. This increases availability and eliminates the single point of failure from your network design. Another benefit, which is quite obvious, but very important, is that link aggregation increases the capacity. The amount of available bandwidth between the devices is multiplied by the number of the links that are being aggregated. For example, you'll get n times higher capacity for the connection between the two devices that are represented in the picture. Let's check now the basic scenario that suggests the need to implement link aggregation. A point-to-point -point link comprised of uh, two R5000 infinite units, hardware revision 11 is represented in the picture. A net throughput of 180 megabits per second is available over the air interface, but the fast Ethernet ports provide a maximum speed of 100 megabits per second. In order to achieve the maximum radio throughput, link aggregation must be implemented for the Ethernet segment and we need third-party switches that have LACP capabilities in order to do this. Both the switches and the infinite units shall be configured for link aggregation. We'll see in a short while how this is done for the infinite units. Let's review first some practical details. Link aggregation requires the implementation of a load balancing algorithm that is responsible for dividing the incoming data flow into multiple independent flows in order to be sent to different lag member ports. 
The quality of the load balancing algorithm is given by a hash function and the complexity of the hash function is associated with the computational power of the device and as a consequence it is also associated with the price of the device. The process involves analyzing each incoming packet and deciding to which port it should be sent. Infinite wireless units implement a very powerful hash function which is a combination of source and destination MAC addresses, VLAN tag, source and destination IP addresses, IP protocol, plus UDP and TCP ports. This ensures an efficient division of the incoming traffic into different threads without worrying about the source of the traffic. Most common switches implement load balancing only based on source or destination MAC or IP addresses. For example, frames with even MAC addresses are sent to port 1 and frames with odd MAC addresses are sent to port 2. If this is the case, you have to make sure that you have different traffic sources so that the switch will be able to load balance the traffic. More advanced switches are capable to divide the traffic into different threads based on multiple criteria, including MAC addresses, IP addresses, TCP, UDP ports, type of application like FTP, HTTP and many other criteria. As a general advice, you should check out the capabilities of your switch and determine the load sharing algorithm that it uses in order to be able to benefit of the load balancing feature. Let's see what are the configuration steps for our infinite units. The infinite wireless LACP implementation fully complies with the IEEE 800.3 AD standard for link aggregation. The first step is to create a log logical interface. Most commonly log0 will be added as it can be seen in our example. Next add the parents of the log interface which for our example will be the two physical Ethernet ports of the hardware 11 unit. An important notice is that you can load balance traffic between any of the unit interfaces including RF or logical PRF interfaces. However, you should never configure load balancing between any joint interfaces. Load balancing works only between different mint areas, so do not join RF and PRF, for example, and afterwards add them as lag parents, because this is not a valid configuration. You also have the option to enable fast mode. This is a proprietary LACP extension that provides an enhanced operation over the standard mode. In fast mode, the speed of response to the link changes is enhanced, the overall system performance is optimized, and more accurate statistics are provided. You can configure an IP address for the lag interface. This way you can access the unit via telnet or through the web interface. And the last step is to add the lag interface to the switch group together with the RF interface. This will allow traffic switching between the lag ports and the RF interface, but this is valid for our point-to-point -point scenario that was earlier introduced. However, if the scenario changes, you might have to adapt the interfaces added to the switch group to the actual scenario. Let's come back to our point-to-point -point scenario that started all the discussion. Assuming that link aggregation has been configured on both the infinite units and on the third-party switches, we'll obtain a practical functionality as described in the new block scheme. This reminds us that LAG0 is a logical interface that has as parents the physical interfaces Ethernet0 and Ethernet1 as part of the LAG. If traffic is generated at an 880 megabits per second rate, the switch will receive it through the gigabit interface and it will split it into two flows of 90 megabits per second each that are balanced between ports 1 and 2 as we can see in the picture. The infinite unit switches the aggregated traffic received through the lag interface towards the RF interface at a rate of 180 megabits per second, benefiting of the full transfer rate over the air. The peer unit will perform load balancing between the Ethernet ports and will send the data towards the switch so that the end user will receive the total 180 megabits per second that were initially generated. We've reviewed the whole process at this point. Let's see now what is the verification procedure. First of all, we can check the LACP status from the command line. 
You should make sure that the interface is up and that the line protocol is also up, meaning that LACP has successfully negotiated and set up the link aggregation. The port state is also very important and it should be active. The locked state indicates that something wrong is going on. The second thing that we can do is to check the interface statistics from the web interface while the data transfer takes place. As we can see, the unit receives an equally amount of data through both Ethernet ports. If we add the traffic up, we get the aggregated 190 megabits per second received through the lag interface. This traffic is switched to the RF interface where we notice the 185 megabits per second at transmission. This has proved that load balancing is working correctly and that all the available radio bandwidth is in use. We'll now walk through a couple of practical scenarios that each bring along specific benefits so we can get a picture about the multitude of solutions that can be adopted for load balancing and redundancy. First, a short mentioning about the fact that you can also implement load balancing for hardware relevant products when those are used as CPEs in a point-to-multipoint topology. This is in case you require increased bandwidth for the last mile connectivity. You just have to configure link aggregation on the CPE side between the switch and the CPE. We have been talking so far about redundancy through the wired Ethernet interfaces, but we can have redundancy over the radio interface as well. Let's begin with a simple example that has the purpose to show an alternative connectivity scheme for hardware 11 units without using any switch. You can set up two parallel links by connecting the local units through the Ethernet interfaces. I must mention again that you can configure link aggregation between the RF interface and the Ethernet interface if you wish because uh, our units do not limit load balancing for the Ethernet interfaces. This configuration is recommended if you need to implement redundancy and capacities of up to 100 megabits per second are sufficient. You can also ensure 100 megabits per second full duplex communication, but we will see in a couple of moments how this can be done. For achieving full radio capacity, you will still need to use two external switches. The last example for load balancing I want to present involves two parallel infilling pro radio links. In this setup, you need to configure link aggregation only for the two external switches that will load balance the traffic between the two radio links. The benefits are that you will double the capacity, achieving a throughput value of up to 560 megabits per second half duplex, and you also have an end to end redundancy implemented. Let's now use the same physical scenario and see what tricks can be done to achieve full duplex communication. As you know, our units use time division duplex or TDD for separating the uplink and downlink directions. This means that only one direction can transmit at a time, so their operation is half duplex. Using any redundancy topology, however, you can benefit a full duplex by forcing the traffic for each direction to go through a different path. We'll force the uplink traffic from the PC to the server to use the link between master1 and slave1, and the downlink traffic will be forced to use the radio link between master2 and slave2. Let's see how this is done. For load balancing, we learned that we need different mint areas. Each radio link is a different mint area in this case, as load balancing does not work for joint interfaces that are part of the same mint area. On the contrary, in order to achieve full duplex communication, we will need to create only one extended mint area. The first configuration step will be to define PRF interfaces and join them with the RF interface for each unit as we can see in the picture. At this point, Mint will have full visibility of the available path between the PC and the server. As we know, the fastest path or the path with the lowest Mint cost is selected for routing the packets towards the Mint destination node. Therefore, all we have to do is to add an extra Mint cost for each radio link in the direction that should be blocked. You have to first check the costs for each path so that you can choose an extra cost value that will ensure a preferential path selection. Use the command mint rf 50 minus extra cost at master2 to increase the cost of the uplink path 
through the link between master2 and slave2 and similarly we should increase the downlink path cost by adding an extra cost for the RF interface at slave1. Let's see what did we achieve by doing all this. We'll use a logical scheme for our further discussion. First of all, an important notice is that you should either enable STP or remove the Ethernet port from the switch group for some units so that only one unit will be able to communicate with the switch on both sides. These measures will eliminate the loops in your network because, as you know, loops can cause very serious broadcast storms that lead to increased bandwidth consumption and high CPU resource utilization. Based on this, we'll assume that Master2 and Slave2 are blocked from communicating with the external network by either STP or by removing the Ethernet port from the switch group. Let's see how the PC will transfer traffic towards the server. The Ethernet frames from PC the Ethernet frames from the PC will arrive at the Ethernet interface of Master1. Master1 will switch between the Ethernet and RF and Mint will choose to transfer the new Mint encapsulated frame towards Slave1 as this is the fastest path in the uplink direction. Slave1 decapsulates the Mint frame and switches the initial Ethernet frame to its own Ethernet interface in order to reach the server. In the downlink, the Ethernet frame from the server will first reach to Slave1 as Slave2 cannot communicate with the switch in order to avoid the loops. Slave1 will switch the frame towards RF and Mint will decide to route the frame through the PRF interface towards Slave2. Master1 represents the Mint destination node and this unit will reconstruct the initial Ethernet frame and it will switch it to the external network in order to reach to PC1. This is the packet flow for the configuration we've performed. Summing up, we have gained some important benefits based on this scenario. Full duplex communication was achieved as we forced the traffic to go through different paths in each direction. We have doubled the transmission capacity at up to 560 megabits per second benefiting of both radio links. We have redundancy because if a link fails, Mint will use the remaining radio link for both uplink and downlink communication as half duplex and at half rate, of course. As an additional mention about the external switches, those can be any simple unmanaged switches that have gigabit Ethernet ports. No additional feature is required, just switching speed. Moreover, as a warning, if you choose to enable STP on our units, you should make sure that the switch is unmanaged or that it can transport STP transparently in order to avoid unexpected network behavior in case of network configuration errors. Let's move forward and check two more practical scenarios. You can benefit of any of the features described so far in a multitude of scenarios for redundancy, link aggregation and full duplex as it best fits your actual requirements. We can see a topology where redundancy over different geographical locations is implemented. This will bring additional benefits because if the radio conditions become unfavorable over one path, it is less probable to experience the same problems over the second path. The picture shows how a camera can be connected with the remote control center using two different radio paths. This is another example of how flexible is the interconnection of our units. The practical scenarios are endless. You can integrate the units in the most diverse networks in order to fit with the actual demands. We can see in the picture how redundancy can be used in order to connect different geographical locations. End-to-end -end redundancy is available and you can add full duplex or load balancing according to your network topology requirement. This is what I wanted to present to you today. I hope that the scenarios presented have helped everybody to enlarge the vision upon the network connectivity schemes and the configurations that are available using our units. That completes our agenda for today. Thank you once again for your time and see you again during our next webinar.